So there's a lot of talk about there, out there about free speech. Uh, a lot of people are debating the limits of free speech and uh, words and language uh, in, in, in particular and how, how powerful words are in our lives and uh, what it means to be offended and, and triggered and being assaulted by language. And we have, we're going to talk about that today on iState. The podcast. That's I state the podcast. And I state, by the way, simply means I alone am my own state. And I advocate for states of billions, seven plus billion states. I mean, <laughs> a very <laughs> humble goal, if you ask me. Joining me also is Bodhi Agora. And you've seen Hi. Bodhi. We do a number of shows together, in, including Lozilla. And when we don't know what we're talking about, we do a Napa show. And wait, we, we do stuff, so it's normal to see Bodie on a show with me. And Cal Molinay here uh, is the – Cal, would you say that you are the originator or the creator of Liberate RVA, which is Liberate <laughs> Richmond, Virginia? Have you yeah, I, I did found it uh, in 2012, yeah. Yep, and uh, I love Liberate Sweet. RVA. I, I support Liberate RVA. I send them one M&M in the mail every month. <laughs> Come what may never <laughs> fail. Never fail, right, Cal? Oh, yeah, it's a, a it's a white M and M. A white, here, white <laughs> yes, oh, dude, dude, nailed it, freaking nailed it, man. Amazing, <laughs> totally amazing. So uh, we're we're live streaming on the Liberty Principle, no consent from the Govern page, and we'll also appear on the I State uh, YouTube channel. And if you want to find all my stuff. And even some of Bodhi's stuff, including this video, you can go to istv.me, and I got everything there. See that, Cal? Easy to remember. Istv.me. That's right. So we're going to begin this show. I want to ask Cal a question. I'm really anxious because I've. This is the first time I've ever. I've, I I don't know you, Cal. This is the first time I've met you. This is yeah. total total spontaneous. <coughs> I've never. Oh, by the way, my name is Paul Gordon. I didn't say that. So, Cal. Free speech, yes or no? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> no, no, that's not. Uh oh, oh my gosh! Uh, I am right, 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 here's the right thing. Here's out the thing. of the gate, I'm triggered. <laughs> I like wow. where this is going. <laughs> Love it. I'm, I'm right, leaving. So, <clears throat> I'm leaving. <laughs> well, you wouldn't have the advances today of like arguing for um, the morality of end slavery if it wasn't free speech, but. You know, there's no such thing as a free speech on uh, private property, right? So free speech is really an issue of property rights. Uh, and so much, you know, you can't yell fire at a movie theater. Property rights reign in which you can and cannot say. You come in my house and yelling at people, calling them crackers, nigger, or uh, what facts? Like, you know, I'm going to ask you to leave, right? Um, so when people talk about free speech, they forget it's really an issue of property rights. And I think that is really the central issue uh, around all of this. And the problems that arise is when you don't have property rights, because then you can have people like Westboro Baptist Church protesting outside your home and yelling obscenities because there's no property rights. Anyone can wander where they want. Uh, but yeah, free speech is important. Uh, the ability to say and have these uh, discourse and arguments and uh, ways to get to a better place as a, you know, Western civilization has advanced and so much in whatever limited areas and spaces under um I guess the ages under uh, Galileo being threatened, you know, not to talk about, you know, his findings in space to uh, the more argument of ending slavery originally from uh, England. And today now, of course, we contend with it because you find people from the far left commies who don't particularly like what you have to say. Anything you do say that goes against their ideas of communism is considered hate speech. Uh, what you kind of what what you see now in Berkeley University now. Uh, but yes, no. Um the commies aren't the only ones who have problems with speech, though, are they? Well, they don't respect property rights, so you know this. That uh, kind of goes in with with all of it. It's not like they can agree with consent to begin with. So they got a lot of problems to begin with, but nothing that they can um, be angry about. Other people are using the same means against them. Yeah, and they well, kind of universalize that very Kantian like. Like, like we've experienced something in the community, which I don't know if you're aware today. of. <laughs> well, no, not today. Although, well, no, not today. Today, somebody decided to unfriend me over words. I don't think that that's just free association. Well, that's, I don't have. Yeah, that's, that. fine. that's it's fine. It's not a problem. No, it's not a problem. What, what do they call you? No, they. they uh, oh, what? Oh, they, I, I can't even remember if it was uh, uh, 
not self-aware or I don't know. Anyway, and it's uh, it's actually somebody that I really like. I hope they change their mind because I actually like this person. <laughs> so we could we could have a discourse. We we're we're basically arguing over language, over the the absolute uh, definitions of language, uh, and he didn't like that I kind of. Well, I, I mean, there are, there are no absolute definitions in language. There are useful definitions in language, but there are no absolute definitions in language. Although, if there are you're limitations. having a, no, if you're having a conversation with someone and you decide to change the terms while you're talking to them, well, then that's a problem. But we yeah. had an experience. Uh, I'm not talking about Bodie and I. Uh, I'm talking about Jeremy Hangler, and what happened mm. there. Oh, yeah. Where jeremy dared to refer to firemen and police as parasites as effing parasites uh, yeah. and and the the right the quote-unquote conservative this i mean i i use terms like right and left loosely but just for the sake of of people that may understand those words uh the right went went absolute crazy they, they 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 try they literally they labeled him as Antifa. They labeled him yeah. as Antifa. They 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 <laughs> they went after his business. They've uh, they've issued death threats to him. They're calling his home. They're threatening his uh, his family. family. I mean, they are demonstrating fundamentally an intolerance for free speech, and they are 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 ostensibly. Ostensibly, I say, respecters of property rights. They're ostensibly standing on that my parchment, my bill of rights, and yet they don't understand or see that their action is not consistent with their state of beliefs. So I think free speech is a, is, a, is a problem on both sides. Well, I won't say both sides. I'll say it's a problem in multiple factions. That's probably a yeah. more accurate because there are no. I mean, both sides. Across implies there's only two sides, but. Across the field. Across basically. the field, yes. It's to me, a uh, problem with free speech is stemming from a fear of of where that speech might lead somebody else. You're not really prepared to deal with the open marketplace of ideas. You want to make sure that your thoughts, that your beliefs win the day, uh, come what may. I don't think that's a unique problem to the to the left. Right. I guess you can say they've been probably coddled too much <clears throat> to be afraid of words or uh, the effects thereof or not being able to control their feelings uh, to what other people say and, and ask so much that they give other people power over their feelings and their visceral reactions to it. Uh, yeah, but at the same time, uh, there's no consequences from free speech. And it's much like there's a guy who was uh, – out in Tennessee talking about, you know, it's great that there was a fire that occurred there and burned down the entire city and town. He happened to be a communist, uh, but his free speech advocacy of this um, celebrating the misery of uh, hundreds of people who lost their businesses and homes um, led to him being fired, right? Uh, so you don't have a, you can say whatever you want, you can say an SMS in, in that respect, but you're not uh, free from the consequences of how other yeah. people can see that. You don't own your reputation. You don't own how right. people can see that. So you got to be kind of smart about that, I would say, um, and in the situation and environment that you're at and how you communicate these ideas. Um, but yeah, in, in terms of that, yeah, the right have a problem with that. Uh, the left have a problem with that. But people advocate the free speech too. Sometimes don't see the end effects and can, you know, put themselves as a weird martyrdom where they don't need to be there to begin with and see the uh, bad consequences of that as uh, Jeremy's kind of experiencing right now. Yeah, with um, with with Jeremy, I mean, interestingly, so many of us that have risen to to help Jeremy in one way, shape, or form, many of us will look at that and like, yeah, that's. Probably not the best termed and worded and timed thing to do. And to a degree, the the consequence of your reputation, even now, me personally, I I do not personally, and I'm not making an uh, like this is a standard that everybody else should follow. But for me personally, I'm very loath to go after a person's business because of words and beliefs that they have. I just not not yeah. generally. I, I I generally don't really like going down that road. But still. That's part of free association. That's not a, a problem in and of itself. But when it goes beyond that to death threats uh, and, and, and stalking and other weird things, okay, now you're crossing a line. Now you're not just dealing with free association. You're not just dealing with, okay, you express well, the thing. 
I'm expressing a thing back to you. I am now making an assessment. You're bordering your on character. aggression. Well, yeah, you're 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 definitely bordering on aggression. It's it's going from idea to action is where there's a bit of an issue. Yeah. I don't know. I think there's better ways we could have uh, talked about that because, like, you know, I was I was in the military and I acknowledged that my position was a military welfare be veteran. Uh, but a lot of people don't get that. You know, instead of going around and calling them, well, you're a military parasite or military welfare. Oh, or, I, I uh, hate that. Right. <laughs> right. Oh, it, it's that's just, not how you make friends. Just, yeah, right. That's yeah, not yeah. how you make exactly, friends. Yeah, exactly. 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 Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm trying to bring people into understand the the language, the liberty, freedom, and it's not going to work that great if uh, you're pushing that far in the corner and um, and that. But I find that to be the theme or pattern that you find with people who are out there as anarchists uh, by the lonesome in the middle of nowhere with uh, nobody else to commiserate with. Uh, you know, their kind of visceral attack it's uh, louder and more um, descriptive <laughs> uh, in that sense. Um, we have many former military folks here. Uh, but even with like attacking the, the firemen, it's like most of them are voluntary already, right? What is it, 70%? Yeah, 70% of the nation's fire departments are all voluntary. Well, 70% of all. 70% uh, right. of them are voluntary. Yeah, the, the, um, the post he was actually was specifically, uh, which he clarified in the comments, but he was, when, he, when he was talking about the parasites, he was specifically referring to the police that shutting were down the roads. shutting down the roads. And that's more specifically but people just decided that this is what he meant uh, you know I, i'm i'm not arguing about the the appropriateness of jeremy's uh, comments and yeah. whether it was good tactics my my point is just that and and you're right and and actually if you talk to jeremy he'll tell you hey he totally understands and gets you yeah i'm sorry when, he does when you make a uh uh when you make us when you when you put a thought out there there's consequences coming back. Totally up for that. The only problem is when it crosses the line from, okay, I'm going to disassociate from you. I'm going to encourage other people to dissociate from you. I'm going to question your character uh, to, to going beyond that, to threats, to uh, personal uh, threats of violence. That's that's the part where you've crossed the line. That's Yeah, but you should have known that that was going to come, right? Well, not not really, because I mean, it he, wasn't he, even he, intentional. He, it wasn't intentional. It was, it was if you look at, I mean, who who the heck? I mean, I put stuff out there on Facebook all the time that I know that I have a certain audience, primarily that when I put it out, they understand what I'm saying. But I could easily see somebody taking one of my comments and putting it up on one of these, uh, you know, police fire whatever massive pages, and suddenly I could come under attack. I wasn't purposely trying to speak to 10,000 firefighters. I was just speaking in frustration and putting something out there to my the audience public, so. that I knew would right, understand okay. the language. At the very least, then, if you get, like, uh, reporters coming to your door and you're holding up a knife, wear a Hillary T-shirt or a Bernie Sanders T-shirt. <laughs> would, would that help? <laughs> just totally still they'll it associate, just, oh, it's associate one of my... With the left or something. Uh, else. Well, well, they do. They do. They have. They've already associated it with the left. They, I know. I know. They associate it with Antifa because they don't know about ANCAPs or right. any other anarchists. They, they just see the anarchy a and they're like, "Oh, that's those guys that are <laughs> yeah. protesting." Right. But but really, this is this is a this is a study in 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 free speech. And if you're going to advocate for free free speech, which I do, I have my own personal reasons why I favor free speech. Uh, if you're going to advocate for it. You have to look at the other side of it, which is free speech doesn't exist in a void. If if you're going to go down right. a path, you can reasonably accept consequences for the path you're going down. This is why I have people, I'm not going to, I'll speak in vaguenesses here, but I have people who have certain types of belief systems that I don't necessarily agree with. And I have thoughts which if I just spoke them plainly, I would probably trigger some folks shut them down, shut doors. And I mean, I'm free to speak and say that on my own, that, that I want to do that. But I, I prefer not to have doors shut down. And therefore, I don't plainly express all the, I mean, I mean, there's a myriad of, of beliefs out there that I don't agree with that, hey, if you have that belief, that's, that's your business. Uh, but since I, since I understand the consequence I choose not to exercise just because I can do it doesn't mean that I should because I want to create I want to 
maintain as much as possible avenues to future cooperation with as many people as I possibly can. Well, yeah. I would. It, it's it's paramount if you're going to use if you're going to. I think the whole point of free speech, or at least a good use for it, is to f use your words to reach an understanding with people you don't necessarily agree with. I think that's probably like really critical. Um, and that's more the freedom of language to be able to kind of, uh, I guess it, it, it's a trick, it's a triggering word, but manipulate, manipulate language. You necessarily manipulate words to communicate, you know, um, but you can still be honest in that endeavor. Right. <clears throat> um, at the really, very least, it's just that you have nothing to hide. You're open to take criticism or, right. uh, you know, other arguments against it, which uh, leads towards the people who are intolerant of that, right? Comments, uh, who are very uh, afraid to talk about their ideas. Very, we find it very difficult to kind of jolt them out to talk about what it is that they actually stand for. Uh, you know, they go out there parading and shouting and screaming and uh, being prideful of being communist or of uh, autism, autism. But, uh, you know, at the very least, you should be able to talk about these ideas and none ever do. Right. Uh, their ideas come with uh, brute force. Their ideas uh, communicate what they communicate. is nothing but savagery, uh, degeneracy and not actually a moment to actually uh, talk about what it is that they advocate for. Um, and if when pressed, Right, they'll just scream, screech, and then they'll just run away. So, but at the very least, versus the other camp, our camp, yeah, well, I'm, I'm happy to talk about what I think will save the world, right? Like they would imagine, like they would do, right? It's like if you think you have like the idea to save humanity and save people, and like this is the way to bring about peace, you should be able to talk about it instead of a runaway encounters. And so, our position, I think, is great. Uh, it shows that we have nothing to hide. We're more than happy to talk about uh, what we think is the correct way about bringing about a peaceful society, uh, voluntarily, consensually, uh, and whereas the other camp doesn't. But I think that also uh, shows and reveals more on their side <laughs> and how, uh, I don't know, I guess uh, on the wrong side of uh, areas of ideas and sharing of free speech than they are more alignment with like fascism that they decry and they become more like the very thing that they're trying to fight against. That's a very common thing. Yeah, the more you rail against something, the more you're actually affirming it. If yeah. you're not open to a conversation, <laughs> if you're not open to uh, even a shift in the dialogue or maybe even a bending of the meaning. You know, I, I look at uh, a lot of people get upset, but I look at dictionaries as a starting point, a starting point. Oh, not we're, we're going down this road. Do you want to? We can. I don't know. Uh, this is part of speech. Language is a part of speech. <laughs> it's so. a part of speech. There, it's a, there's there's certain conventions and there's certain understandings, but I think we can adapt and 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 reach a much better understanding. Well, well, my issue with. Uh, and I'm using this term broadly, Cal. I don't exactly know how you're using the word communist, but I'll use the word communist. Uh, and I've actually run into, I mean, there are folks that say they're communists that really have very uh. little understanding of what <laughs> communism is. But when I run into folks that have any degree of actual understanding of communism, when they start talking about the labor theory of value and whatever, uh, I have noticed those conversations I mean, I, I don't believe that there is any absolute definition of words, but when you start a conversation and you say, okay, let's define our terms, you cannot get them to define their terms. <laughs> nope. That's a problem. <laughs> and then if and when you might get them to define a term, what they'll do is somewhere down the course of that conversation, they'll change, change the term. <laughs> They'll sub They'll it out. They'll change the definition on you. You yeah. can't pin them down. It's like they don't want to have – a conversation uh, that leads to an understanding, whether it's an understanding of what what you are talking about or, you know, sometimes I have conversations with people where, especially people that don't agree with what I have to say, where I'm actually hoping to understand more what I think by having a conversation with them. There's no, right. there's no hope or help there to understand. It's about, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to give you the magic fuzzy bunny version of communism. And if you don't accept the magic bunny bu fuzzy bunny version of communism, you're literally worse than Hitler. <laughs> that's, 
Yeah. That's the <laughs> tactic. Am I right? Yeah, no, no, no. It's uh, false equivalency. Right. Um, it's really difficult for, for them to pin, to pin it down on definitions of any kind. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's as such, so that way they can kind of worm their way out of uh, debates and arguments and uh, change it any time they need to see fit. Um, very weasel-like, you can say. Um, and oftentimes I feel like I have to provide them a definition of what it is that they're trying to talk about because they don't particularly have any. Uh, which is more of a testament at how much that a lot of these people who advocate for communism don't really know what it is that they're advocating for or much less the history of communism. Um, so uh, I, for the most part, that's kind of my encounters with communists. They don't know the history. They don't know uh, the horrors that have come with uh, Soviet socialism or national Soviet socialism. Uh, they just uh, think it's a pretty cool way to kind of find a solution to uh, problems that they have to kind of make up, you know, find more ways to feel even more victimized or make them some feel more uh, sense of worth or sense of um, a value. Um, for example, like they want to help the poor, but most of these people that I've seen, uh, these communists are middle class white kids. And they would rather dress down to look like the poor. They'd rather put themselves into like ex experiments, environments where like they're like the poor instead of like, well, look, if you're poor, maybe I should elevate you to up where I am <laughs> in the middle class and be more capitalistic. But they think the best solution is to identify and become like the poor, to help the poor. So so the best way for equality and justice to is to everybody should wear burlap bags. Yes. <laughs> Dude, burlap potato bags. Potato yes. bags. That's that's the only way anything else is oppression. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I yeah, I, I get that. I get that. I, I I mean I've run into different ideologies that if their starting point for me is some sort of utopian outcome, there is always it's, it, there's always this barrier to defining the terms, and and it's not just true of communists, although, and when I say communist, I mean real, true blue quote unquote believing communists, such as that is possible. Uh, that those willing to use force to th those well, the <laughs> reason that they're willing to use force is because they have an idea of a utopian outcome where it's like the end of history. Uh, the end of conflict, which, you know, as a, I, I mean, I, I'll say for, for lack of a better term, as an anarchist myself, I don't have that utopian starting point. Hey, there can't be any conflict if everyone's dead. I, I, r r well, that's uh. true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> well, no, because then you got to look at, you know what? It's the minute that every human being is dead, if there's one human being left with that ideology, they're going to start to analyze species and start to see conflict there. And then oh. we're going to have more problems. Not until everything is dead, until all matter is static and unmoving will conflict until the eventual, cease to exist. Until the eventual heat death of the universe, we right. will not know peace. Uh, right. Until you find nature to be oppressive. Well, <laughs> and well, then that too must die. Your, your very existence is uh, is a, an amalgamation of uh, of conflicts, biological <laughs> conflicts from within. So. For a lot of the white communists, they are, because they believe that all white people are inherently racist. And then so, of course, when a lot of them talk about yeah. what do you do with racists, you kill them and you just remind them and start with yourself, right? Uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> I, like I've, I talked to some of this, like, dude, so like the whole like and white supremacy. Like, what do you see with this white supremacy? Uh, you know, there's there's laws here of affirmative action that advocate that you know it's okay to discriminate against someone in the workplace if they're white, right? That's not a sign of white supremacy. No. But then, like, uh, then I asked, like, do you think yourself are racist? And like, yeah, I, I think I'm racist too. It's like Jesus Christ. You talk about <laughs> hitting yourself in the back. It's not a starting uh, point with that conversation. It's no, uh, no, that's like, ridiculous. It's a, it's a. That's how dangerous that disease is, though, and how it spreads, and that, that guilt over something you have never had anything to do with. It's just uh, collective guilt. I'd rather have collective guilt of like losing us to a, uh, I don't know, hockey team. <laughs> we didn't beat them. We lost. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Yeah. As, as a sportser, I'm a recovering sportser. Actually, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of falling away from sports, but it's not because it's just. I'm not really. I don't have a problem with sportsers. If you want to watch sports, it's totally fine with me. But uh, yeah, I'm kind of following away, falling away from sports, only because I have so much actual real drama in my life 
that's like, Ugh. do I need a drama More? that... I mean, I already have drama that I can't control. That's like... And that's like exponentially true of rooting for a sports team. You have no control whatsoever. Uh, well, especially when you're an Eagles fan. Well, that's uh. true, and I'm a Philadelphia Eagles fan, so uh. yeah, I, I I confess. Although it's like I, I've left. I, the NFL is like one of the few things that I'm still holding on to. Uh, <laughs> and, and and again, it's not like I don't have any kind of ideological reason. It's just yeah. I, I just I'm tired of the drama. I'm tired of. Uh, uh, and and even the 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 triumphs are, I'm looking at the triumphs and I'm like, why are you celebrating? It's, it's, you know, what did you do? Although again, there's nothing wrong in my book with anybody that wants to go out and distract. I, I distract myself. I I I, uh, I love music and I'm getting back into music now, so I'm listening to tons and tons of music. I like music nice. from all kinds. I I create. Cal, I'll have to share. I'll tag you one time. I do a. I keep a top 100 of my favorite new songs weekly. Yeah. yeah. A little bit OCD, I, I grant you that. Uh. But you will find in that list plenty of bubblegum pop. I mean, not a lot, but you'll find bubblegum pop. You'll find totally frivolous stuff that I yeah, know it's frivolous. it's still frivolous. stuck to my shoe. Right. It's still stu- <laughs> right, exactly. So I, I have no problem with candy in your life. No problem whatsoever. When it goes beyond candy to actually – you're framing your life around it. Uh, well, then, then the state is actually getting what it wants out of the candy. If if the candy right. is just a, yeah. you know, a, a serpent of the, you know, a respite from from the turmoil's great. But when it goes beyond that, then you got a problem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't like. Um, I can't. I, don't, I can't sit around for like an hour or two and watch other people have fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly. That's, that seems to be my thing with sports. Growing up and everything is like, hey, like let's go see the soccer games. Like I can't. I'd rather you know explore underneath the stadium and walk underneath the bleachers. And um, it's like I'd rather play soccer or, or do the football thing than watch other people do the football thing and kick the ball around. Um, do but you, I don't know, do you used to refer to soccer as football in America? That's hate uh, speech right there. <laughs> that is actual I tell you an interesting hate story. speech. So like in Bolivia. Um, the largest, um, like, so you have a lot of competition in, in uh, Latin America, of course, and for a time being, they didn't want to compete in Bolivia because Bolivia is located so up high in the mountains, it takes like a week or two to acclimatize to the oxygen levels. So we have like a home field advantage, so to speak. Um, so they're trying to eliminate Bolivia, but like the president, uh, Evo Morales, like went up to the like highest mountain snow cap. They play soccer in the snow on top of a mountain, uh, which is interesting, except, except for this other particular um game he did with the other players and it was like this one guy accidentally cleaved him you know the spikes on the shoes that they yeah. have cleaved cleaved um, eva morales i don't like the guy but i'm just saying this is a hilarious moment eva morales looked at his legs and then walked up to him and just kicked him right in the balls live on tv nice <laughs> and that's and that's and that's why we have to have closed borders folks. right there that's why that's there you <laughs> kicked go him right in the balls and eventually the uh, the, the sports uh, whatever uh, organization relented and said, okay, we'll compete in Bolivia. Um, so, yeah, I, I find myself actually having home field advantages here at times, being able to outrun a lot of people because you're able to take in more oxygen at a lower uh, field than uh, higher altitudes. So you like you don't like vicarious play. That's what you're saying. Yeah, that's what it is. I'm not, uh, I'm not, yeah, man, you know, you live through vicariously through other people. It's like reading books of adventures or people writing about poetry and waterfalls they've never experienced. Like, dude, get the fuck out there and go live this stuff. I like reading. <laughs> I like reading about what, well, actually, I don't read about waterfalls. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of people who live uh, comfortably and safely in their own living rooms instead of uh, taking a moment of risk to go out there and adventure. Uh, and I think uh, spreading anarchy is a big part of that, getting out of your comfort zone. Uh, and getting in there and confronting these commies uh, is a big part of that. Being adventurous like uh, people in the past have been and exploring and uh, going to the North Pole and, and risking. Um, I, I think a lot of that sense of adventure has been lost, I found, uh, in the past years that, that I've seen. I don't know that that's a, a recent phenomenon, actually. I think that, yeah, I think it's existed for a while. I, I, I mean, we, you, you, we live in a... Maybe the security isn't quite what it was, perception or real, but perception kind of becomes reality. But there's been a sense of 
of security and finality in the West, especially, especially in America, that, uh, you know, the, the explorers, the pioneers, they're, they're not necessarily, I'm going to put this in quotes, needed. So we're not groom. We're not. We're not creating an environment that's conducive to explorers and pioneers emerging. You're not, especially a majority of males that grew up in uh, public high schools, where it's like 76 uh, percent females that are public school teachers. Uh, that kind of caters more to f girls than boys. You know, these are not environment for boys. Um, especially you find like uh, the sep like high divorce rates. Uh, you know, the state being the new parent, and if the state is a new parent, the, the state is telling you, don't do this, this or that. Regulate this, this or that. You need a permit to do that. You need a license to do that. Be careful, you might die. We'll find you if you do this. And so, kind of eliminating uh, the experience of taking bold and daring risks uh, and living out your life and adventuring uh, seems to have been kind of eliminated. Lest you, you know, harm, you know, government property <laughs> yourself. Well, there's, yeah. I, I've seen, well, go ahead, Bodie. No, I was just. Oh, you didn't have anything insightful and Yeah, so, so, that's, so that's, so that's what I've seen with, with a lot of this stuff. I mean, that's why dodgeball has been taken away, right? You know, you should be, I, right. I play dodgeball at a public schools and then they say, oh no, it's too harsh. You know, you don't want to be the last kid who gets picked on a team. It's like, <laughs> this is part of life. Now everyone's getting participation trophies, but it's not so much the kids. People playing the kids are saying like, well, the kids, well, you got participation. No, it's the parents. The parents are to blame for that. The parents would be the ones like, no, my kid isn't getting this participation trophy. And some are doing that, but it's not, not. It's not millennials that are fault. It's the parents of millennials who are at fault who are allowing that to happen and not stepping in and putting their foot down against that stuff. The risk of failure. The risk of failure is being systematically removed from people's right. consciousness. And, you know, and, but and, it, it's the only way to learn. You do not learn unless you go out and try. You do not become an expert unless you fail a million freaking times. You, and, you have to fail. You have to be. Sometimes you. It's good to be wrong. Right. And, government and you're not going to know. That. You're not yeah. going to know until you just go out there and do it. Well, the, right. the, the very concept. Just of, do it. The very concept <laughs> of being protected from failure is, is, is totally conducive to, uh, advancing the myth of the state. It's it's the very reason that the state has quote unquote legitimacy. The state will protect you from failure. Right. That is what underlies all surrender to coercive authority in your name. It's, I will be protected from a risk of failure. So the agenda of the state is being advanced. And really, this comes back to free speech. This is why free speech is so, so significantly important, not, not through government edict, but through, I will say, through social uh, a demonstration through uh, social backlash. If you want to try to impede uh, free speech, I'm not talking about consequences for your speech. I'm talking about going beyond that to coercively trying to shut down someone down uh, in, a, in, a, in a venue that you don't own. I should uh, also clarify uh, yeah. that 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 really that is the fruit. It's both the fruit of and the perpetuation of the 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 core. I'll say the core raison d'etre of the state, such as you see it. Now, from the state's perspective, it's very different. But from the from your perspective, the raison d'etre of the state is it will protect me from failure and right. free speech. If I can stop somebody from speaking, it's. Uh, I mean, all throughout the ages. All these, you, you know, yeah. whether it's religion or uh, political ideology, the idea is we can't let our children, we can't let our adults, we can't let our our people hear these dangerous ideas because then we're going to lose, and we don't want that. So, you know, well, and that's that's the ultimate test. You cannot ban like banning things doesn't work. Uh, you cannot outlaw demand. If there's a demand, I, I, and, that, and I, this is a great. This is this is well. I you think, can make I it think, harder. I think, I think banning things does work to a certain degree. Will, will it work over a sustained yeah. period of time? Maybe no. not so much, but but it can but work to a certain degree. A great criticism of the left is, um, you know, they want to shut down certain speeches or certain speakers or whatever, but they never could fill a venue themselves. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, point. if you really want, why don't you get together? Why don't you sell some tickets and fill a venue peacefully rather than wrecking someone else's? Right. <laughs> You're not going to, like, 
it, it doesn't make sense to me because then it, all it means is there's just a couple provocures and everybody's jumping in on it and the demand's not really there. Sorry, are you? Are if there you... was really that much of a demand, these venues wouldn't have people going and speaking at them. No, it's it's meeting a demand. It's meeting it's a need. Meeting a demand. It's just the market. It's a free. That's the free market in action, and they don't like it. Uh, unfortunately, the demand that it's meeting is not necessarily the path to liberty, but <laughs> and it's not necessarily one I agree with. Right. But I that's not my business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, speaking of free speech, um, I think a lot of that is very important, especially at the university level. <clears throat> that's where all this Marxism is coming out from, right? And that's why you find a turbulent type of um, uh, backlash at Berkeley or the People's Republic of California uh, <laughs> kind of uh, <laughs> response to that. Um, I, I don't know where else where it would be most important. I mean, Facebook's a great important place, but like now they're actually cutting down on people posting uh, anti-communist memes, which is interesting. Uh, you know, there's different there's sort of battle, battlegrounds out there, but I think they're all just as important. I think the most important thing you can do is just to talk about it, whether there's a yep. post on Facebook, uh, comment, criticism, videos like this. Um, and for me, I find it to be at my university, VCU, and uh, to go out there and combat these uh, sort of uh, ideas that will lead again, time and time again, to murderous results. Um, otherwise, if um, we don't, it wins by default, right? It becomes um, it becomes the socially accepted thing, and right. people are because sheeple. I mean, they don't right. Nobody's hearing any other alternative. There's nothing right. else that no one knows that. The, what else can I do? It's like, well, I hate the government. I hate what's going on. Uh, and then, of course, you hear universal level. They talk about Marxism. I guess they'll think like, well, maybe this is the alternative thought. Maybe this right. is the uh, the, uh, the only way one. outside of right, right. And for the government, yeah, it works out for them because at least in Marxism, you still advocate for government, and so you know it's a win-win for everybody in the, the status uh, cult group. Um, but to a certain right. degree, Cal, you in the you know in the university setting, as as I'm sure that you know, you're you're, you're in a small bubble of reality that is uh, in in America today. You're, you're a small bubble. Now, unfortunately, the small bubble that you're in, the people that are in that small bubble are eventually going to be the, the gatekeepers. Right. <laughs> and that's a right. big problem. However, <laughs> it is. I, I will say that I believe that the SJW feminists, third wave feminists, uh, all, all of these ideologies that are born from this uh, presumption that I will define uh, morality and you will march lockstep with that morality uh, – they're kind of losing. Uh, you saw, I don't know if you saw the video with Lacey Green recently, where all of a sudden, La Lacey Green, uh, who, I mean, <laughs> my daughter said that she liked Lacey Green. I'm like, what? Oh, I don't, I mean, <laughs> I was like, whoa. I, now, I, I mean, I reacted like that. And then I sat, I tried to sit down with her and calmly and talk about calmly, although I, 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 I'll just say that, yes, I, I, I dropped a few expletives to my 12 year old daughter. Fight me. <laughs> it happened. It happened. I apologize. I repent. But, uh, but, but, uh, so, so, so she puts this video out recently where she's now questioning. And, and I think she's questioning because she's starting to see that the standards that they're, uh, selecting and in part Cal because they don't have, terms that they're going to stand on solidly and stay in one place. They're not going to stay in one place with any term. That's a problem. That They're starting to cannibalize each other. And she pointed out how a feminist put an article out in a feminist publication where she was comparing transgenderism to Rachel DeLotzel and the response was that all the feminists put out this this hate stuff against this fem this other feminist calling for her to be fired, calling for the paper to be pulled, calling for the hate speech. And, and I think she's starting and I, it's going to happen more and more as these folks are starting to realize the rope spear effect is kicking in. It's going to uh, be their heads, you know, rope spear for those who don't know, he's the guy yeah. that was behind the, terror the I know, you know, uh, he was behind the, the French terror and uh, eventually he ended up, uh, on his own guillotine. On the guillotine too. <laughs> literally, literally hoisted on his own petard. So. Yeah. <laughs> and I, no, I, I think. Go ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead. 
I was saying that, yeah, I think the best thing about, like, I know, where, where is all this Marxism, communism, feminism, communism? I think it's from parenting, really. I mean, again, I guess the high divorce rate and the state is becoming the new parent. And, of course, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to find some comfort then in some something else other than uh, the absence or neglect of parenting that's not been at the home. Um, otherwise, if you do have good parenting or good brotherhoodship, like myself and my younger siblings, like my, my sister Jennifer showed her with me like two months ago, like an anti-feminist video. I've never talked to her about feminism. You know, she reads my Facebook walls, she, she, she sees for herself, right? But it's a good reflective of like uh, the modeling behavior that people would have and people will show. And then when I asked her once about like feminism, what do you think about feminism? It's like, yeah, she thinks it's stupid because it's just, um, you know, she thinks like there's other ways to talk about equality than trying to talk about like how males are bad and evil uh, and kind of push that kind of agenda. Uh, but it was like it was great for me to hear her. So like she shared with me for the first time like an anti-feminist video that she didn't agree with. She's about to graduate from high school, so she's going to go to university. So for me, it's like I know that she'll be good. I know like the first two years, she's not, but she's not not in that first year, so she's not going to be persuaded of the social justice warrior agenda, and come out uh, at the end of that. Yeah, which is a big deal. It's like for a lot of parents, I would kind of worry about them sending their kids to university because that's where a lot of the stuff is coming from. Uh, you, you send them in there, you know, uh, with good values. Hopefully, if you were a good parent, if you did your job right, they will not turn out to be a Marxist, uh, feminist, uh, cancer scumbag at the end. Because um, at the very end of it, this, this very reflective then with their own relationships with their own parents and their siblings, right? And that's how I know my sister will never be a feminist because uh, she doesn't hate me. <laughs> Because <laughs> he loves me, um, and my brother Alvaro too. He's going to law school now, uh, so we're, we share memes and all that stuff together. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think that's the best way to kind of maybe combat a lot of this. You know, attack the university center, but at the same thing, it's a familiar relationship, make sure it's good and strong, uh, and you have these good uh, ties together. And it's not not something that the state can shred and rip apart with pretentious ideology that they'll teach at uh, universities. Uh, you know, because they'll test it, and then when they test it, you know, okay. your your sons and daughters have to be strong enough to contest back and speak back against that and call it off of the bullshit, succulent bullshit that it is. And I, I would say, speak back judiciously. Uh, make sure that yeah. you are fighting it, that it's a battle that you need to fight. You don't have to speak back against every single thing uh, that they put out there, uh, but speak back, understanding the consequences that sometimes you could pay a heavy price. For speaking back, but what they do in the universities, it's well, it's I, I, you know, the word racism I think describes what it is that they do. So, racism has a connotation which is almost universal. When you hear the word racism, it means you're a terrible person, it means you're a social pariah. You're, you're not even you're not even in the realm of somebody to have a conversation with. You're indecent, you're inappropriate, and there's no place for you in civil society. That's kind of the connotation of the word racism. Now what civil society. Si right, right. Now what they have done is they've made sure to maintain the connotation of the word racism. But what they've done is they've changed the definition of the word racism. And if you challenge their, their definition, I mean, the definition is basically racism has all has been for, you know, for a long time. I don't, I don't know the exact etymological root of the word racism, where it came from, but for, for me growing up generation upon generation, uh, racism is because of, of your race, I am going to make a judgment about you <coughs> based on your race and nothing else. doesn't matter who you are as a person. I'm not assessing you as an individual. I'm assessing you by the race that you are. They've changed that to racism is only something that white people possess because you can only be a racist if you're the dominant culture. So what they've right. done is they have, uh, they've created an environment in which whiteness in and of itself, is racism. And right. you're going into an environment where you have a whole bunch of people around you, including college students, because college students, man, they're afraid. They just want to get good grades, man. They just want to get by. They want to keep their head low. And they're creating this this, 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 this tone that, that there's no dialogue. There's no discourse. It's like you don't stand up and try to defend pedophilia. Well, well, some people do, but <laughs> they don't have it. You're uh, going to have a bad time. Milo Yavovavonich, Milo Stefanofagus. Oh, God, I hate that guy. 
Yeah, no, but I, but I get what you're saying. Um, and I find that because of that, a lot of my uh, white classmates won't talk back or stand up for themselves because they've already been conditioned not to. Yeah. Um, but I think like uh, the best thing you can do then to rear, child, rear, rear, rear your children into that position is to always be able to really be able to question. Uh, even yourself as a parent or me as a raising them myself. Uh, as I've always told, it's like, listen, you can say whatever you want. Always know I have your back. And I'm just telling them going through public school or eventually they went to private school that there is nothing you'll never get in trouble with, right? Nothing. There's nothing that uh, they could ever say, hey, you're doing this bad. You ever get detention. I have your back. Nothing bad will ever happen to you. So feel free to explore this world. Say what's on your mind. Do what you want. Do what you think you need to be done. Stand up for what you think is right. Uh, there's nothing bad that will ever happen to you. And I think that kind of security helps uh, these children kind of grow up. And two, finally, to the university level, to do what they feel needs to be done and say what needs to be said. Um, I think uh, for my my, my brother and uh, J sister, Jennifer and Albert, that they've kind of taken that to heart. Uh, but especially at the university level, when they do talk like what you're talking about, uh, when they say, well, you know, you have like cultural appreciation month for all these other cultures, but white people can't have that. Right. Uh, you, you have uh, they have put like the check your privilege sort of uh, courses and these sort of things telling by people like, you know, and, and, and you some need to of them shut up. And, right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're pretty much saying like white people need to shut up when other people of skin color are talking. Um, so, yeah, it's and when people talk like, you know, where is all this uh, white nationalism or ethnocentric kind of groups coming from? It's like it's a reaction to all of these leftists pushing people in the corner. Uh, that's where it's coming from. It's not like it came out of nowhere. Eventually, push people right. in the corner long enough and, and, and shame them long enough. They're, you know, they're going to coalesce. <laughs> they're going to re respond to that. Uh, you know, so they have them themselves to blame for, like uh, for Trump, <laughs> especially. What do you think? What's going to happen? <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, they're going down the same path. They're going to go down the same Robespierre path as the SJWs, and I already start to see them to a certain degree cannibalizing themselves and and their own test for purity. So they're kind of yeah. co-opting leftist culture, is the way that I would word it. Yeah, and I've always seen it kind of go to back to an equilibrium between back and forth. You know, um, you find uh, all of history is rife with going back to an equilibrium. Uh, at the very moment where Western civilization uh, is at its uh, deathbed, they fight back finally. Uh, not to say that it's going to go to a better place, but it goes back to an equilibrium. Like, again, like Charles Martel at the Battle of Tours uh, and many other battles uh, in Europe where, like, after, like, several hundred years of, like, Muslim invasion in Europe, they're going to fight back, and that's where it creates the First Crusades. Um, you know, eventually you find a lot of push against uh, this culture. Eventually there's going to be a visceral reaction to it. Not to say that... Uh, and that's just an examination of the patterns of where things naturally head to. Yeah, violence um, begets violence. It's... Right. Those are short-term gains. That's it. Um, whereas, like, us as anarchists, we look for the long-term game. Right. We're looking <laughs> long -term to end. change the, the, right. the definitions entirely, really. Right, right, like, right. Like, change right. the paradigm. Uh, we want to stop repeating this. Right, right. yeah. Right, yeah. We, so, we would like to, I mean, we're, we're still going to have violence. We're still going to have bad things happen. But it's... Right. You know, when you get one idiot who decides to do violent things, he's not going to be able to control a military that can march 10 million people off to their deaths. He may right. he may take out a couple hundred, maybe at most. You know, <laughs> the, the kill, and I'm not saying, you know, but I mean, the killings are going to be at a lot smaller scale in anarchy. Yeah, to, in, in our yeah good, good luck. Yeah, people bring up like, what about private military? I always bring up the Pinkertons. How many, how many cities did the Pinkertons take over? Because at one point in time, the Pinkertons had more armed people employed the the entire United States military combined. Yeah, but so, then they started taking military contracts. At so the very end, yeah, that's yeah at the very the end problem. they did. But the thing is, yeah, at the very but but in the very beginning they didn't. In the very beginning they were very good at what they did in the investigative services. They went after bank robbers, they right. ran after like yeah, people who yeah, like absolutely. did an awesome job. At the very end they took up their contracts. Uh, but at the same time, I could say that the government one of those concerts to be taken because they wanted to know how the Pinkertons worked because not long after that happened, the government was able to pass laws to shut down the Pinkertons to pave way for the new investigative services, the FBI. Right. So they needed to eliminate their competition. They wanted to learn from what the free market was able to produce so that they can eliminate them and create the FBI. 
and that's just that's the foundation and history of the FBI. It was uh, learning from what how the Pinkertons were good at what they did and investigating crimes and solving them um, and restoring justice that they did not particularly want a market company, just like uh, Lysander Spooner. <laughs> the government did not want the American Little Milk Company competing, and they had to shut it down uh, and so that they were able to compete against them. Yeah, because they couldn't. They couldn't fairly compete with him, and they feared the competition. So they feared right. the, they feared the uncertainty, and so right. they shut it down. <laughs> Which again <laughs> goes back to that root. You know, I I want to be certain that I'm not going to fail, and so to do that, I am going to advocate that that human beings with lethal force show up at your door if if you go beyond a certain point which if, if that poor, if that certain point doesn't meet the criterion that you're actually doing violence or uh, taking course of action against another person uh initiating course of action doesn't matter what matters is if your action could potentially put my perception of security at risk if right. the mere existence of your business means that my business might suffer you know what? I'm going to lobby the government to pass regulations to ensure that if you violate those regulations, if push comes to shove and we keep going down the trail of consequences, at the end is a guy with a gun pointed right. at your head for my, for my securities. Which, you know, which, which, which again takes us back to why it is, I mean, why it is that uh, it's so essential that you have a community, a society, a culture, whatever scales we're talking about that that has a a free will voluntary respect of free speech that recognizes in free speech uh a benefit to their own self-interest if their self-interest is as mine is which i think cal that you would agree when i say what my self-interest is and i think Bodhi, you would agree my self-interest is that i live in a world where I have the greatest opportunity to do things of my own free will and volition with as little coercive action uh, facing me as a consequence of the decision that I've made, with as little as possible. And I recognize that in order for that to happen, I need as many people around me having that, that power right, yeah. as well. So if you don't prefer that, then w we cannot coexist. We've got a problem. <laughs> we got right. a pro we're heading... We're heading to loggerheads is, is, is what we're doing. And free speech is, is the absolute cornerstone because the free spreading of, of thought and ideas. And I will say, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you, Cal. Uh, I'm going to challenge you that uh, there's something beyond free speech. And I'm just thinking of this as I'm talking to you. And I, I don't know what to call it, but there is a, uh, you're, you're not taking coercive action against someone but you're 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 holding on to an idea, a thought, a proposition in your head that becomes a part of your identity. It becomes your territory, and and you you will so defend it that when anybody ever divulges ever so slightly from your territory, even if they're in your quote unquote group, you're going to shut them down. You're going to disassociate, and that's your you know that's fine if you want to disassociate. That that type of thinking, I believe. Is it's not as dangerous as wanting to shut down free speech, but that type of think thinking is really limiting the ability of the liberty community to test thoughts, ideas, to come honestly to an understanding of who, quote unquote, we are and how we get from coercive enterprise thought all around us to uh, voluntary thought all around us. I would say challenge accepted. <clears throat> I've experienced this this uh, twice, maybe three times actually, since 2012. So of course you, you come across drama and some kind of reaction to some of the ideas you have, but like, having this happen like three times is not that bad. Uh, and that, uh, so you have the foundation of the organization you want to create, right? It's like not everyone's going to be in the same anarchist community. Uh, every, you can have an anarchist golf course community that's against football, right? No football here on the grass green, right? right. Uh, just golf, right? So you can have that, right? You can have rules with that. And so the rules are recreated, so it has to be non-political. The rules are recreated, that so this is a capitalist group. The rules are recreated, that this is a free market uh, group that we advocate for property rights, right? So of course, the rules have already been established and laid out in the very beginning in this foundation. And so anything that goes against that, uh, you know, feel free to leave or create your own group. Not to say that you can't. 
right? Right. Um, and so this has happened like three times with one person going out to say, well, I want to be a mutualist and becoming very anti-capitalistic. And I'm, 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 and I'm telling him that's fine, but it just can't be part of Liberty RBA, right? Because we have a lot of new people coming in all the time trying to understand and learn this sort of things. And not to say that um, you can't talk about it. You can, but not in a particular purview of venue in which we're teaching people about capitalism in the free market. Um, and not to say that uh, I won't talk to you about it because I tell them all the time, if you want to have a debate, let's have a debate. I'd be happy to like smash your, your fantasy into <laughs> pieces. I say and, that with and, love. Yeah, I say it with love <laughs> because the thing is, I don't want other people falling into uh, a path of uh, a failure. Uh, and so, you know, I had to, had to, had to kick somebody out for that because he thought that was a good venue. And I told him from the very beginning, this is not, and he knew it. I had to kick somebody out for being a zeitgeister. There's like one zeitgeister in all of Richmond. And he thought there's a venue to talk about zeitgeist. And it's like, oh, it's not. It's like, from look, look, look at the webpage. The webpage and all this stuff hasn't really changed at all. It's from the very beginning. This is what we've established ourselves. We will never be an anti-capitalist group. I'm sorry that you're upset that you can't change the uh, the group towards being anti-capitalism, but that's the way it was founded. That's the way it's always going to be. I can't even change it. Like the moment that I think for myself I could be a politician, I get kicked out of my own group, right? So the rules are very are universal, are concrete, uh, well worded. There's no exceptions. That even myself, if I were to go against it, I will be kicked out, right? And it was designed that way so that way no one can overtake the group and change the meaning in a different direction where it was supposed to go. Uh, and so. After uh, since 2012, now being five years later, just having three people to leave, that's not bad at all. But it's never been the case when I've talked to them that if you want to have a conversation and record this free speech conversation, let's do it. Because for me, I think you have horrible ideas and I think those ideas need to go away. And I'd be happy to have a recorded talk about that to show people how where, where that would lead naturally otherwise. Uh, but they always uh, are afraid of that and don't really have the virtual conviction that you would need, right? If you think you have such great ideas, you should be able to talk about it. Right. But right. like AMCONs, they don't and they hide and run away. So yeah, free speech is very important, but at the same time, like you go in a movie theater, you don't want someone yelling a fire all the time while you're watching a movie, or uh, I don't want someone yelling out vicinities in my own house. Uh, but not to say that we can't discuss it. I want to discuss it. Uh, but there's different venues that we can do this and do it as a way to get to a better place. Yeah, I, and I agree. I totally. I mean, yeah. I'm I'm a champion of free associations, come what may, and I'm I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of of standards, and yeah. and and, and the, the more uh, more defined your association, the more standards you have. I understand yeah. that. The 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 less defined your association. The less standard you have, my my issue is actually with, with I won't say my issue, but my observations are that I mean this is across the board. This is you know I'm it, within Christian circles, within atheist circles, yeah. within that that there is this tendency within the larger, broader association, there is effort to define who's in or out of that larger association based on standards that reflect a more uh, a more defined association than exists <laughs> that you're applying you're applying liberate RVA standards to the broad anarchist community for instance not you specifically but I'm saying like you know yeah uh, liberty RVA is 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 all you know it's capitalism you don't deviate from from capitalism I, I totally understand that right so if I were to want to talk to you about property rights probably Maybe within Liberate RVA, there's an assumption right away, uh, and I'm just being a devil's advocate. I'm not saying I do or do not want to talk. Uh, within Liberate RVA, talking about property rights within that venue, probably not so good. Probably like outside of a Liberate RVA event, I'm sure that you're friends with these folks that uh, that are part of Liberate RVA that, you know, you go over to somebody's house, you're not at a Liberate RVA event. Maybe you'll talk about property rights in that venue, right? Uh, and you're open to uh, uh, talking about that. Uh, to having that discussion, to exploring dangerous thoughts, I'll say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's not to say, like, in the forum on Facebook, these ideas will come out. There's a lot of people who cares about these ideas. And, I, and we, we talk about this stuff all the time. Um, it's not to say, like, well, you can't talk about anti-capitalism. Uh, like, we, 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 those conversations have come up. They talk about, like, well, what do you guys think about this argument against capitalism? We talk about it. We argue about it. We present the facts against it. Um, but if you're like someone who's like like a zeitgeist, vehemently, like you know, it's like, well, you know, good luck with your zeitgeist chapter. If you want to have a debate, let's have the debate. 
but don't try to push your politics into a group because you're only a group of one <laughs> and haven't succeeded. You've been failing trying to convert other people that you feel now you have to go and argue to try to see if you can convert anyone here. Um, it's like, uh, I guess you could say in a weird way, uh, what, what do they say? Like Hans Hermann Hoppe will say like, you know, if you live in the libertarian order, uh, you don't want particularly uh, the communist or the Democrat kind to come in there and talk about leftism or increase in the states, right? Um, you know, we can have a, a different arena, which I think would be awesome, like a boxing arena, but for like people <laughs> who want to debate. <laughs> and like a left corner of the leftists, on the right, a negative rights advocate. And let's go and talk about uh, freedom of speech. Uh, and Total have that as a center square, huh? Yeah, it's the, it's the Agora. It's the market of ideas. Right, right. Yeah. And that'd be awesome and sweet to have. Uh, so not against that open for that please I, I i'm out there all the time I, I, for anyone I, who opposes you know, me if, to come if, out and if, talk if you ever get that and I, I could i could probably create something or Bodhi can too but i'm not the only one but i can create something that <laughs> kind of makes you look like you're in a boxing ring against someone <laughs> that, that would actually be awesome. awesome you know what you I, should I'm, do it. I'm totally stealing your idea i'm going to do uh, that so well uh, peas <laughs> so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this show up. We're, we're yeah. about an hour into this, and uh, I like to keep things more or less to an hour. I think yeah, it's a yeah. good, good time. Good. Uh, do we have any 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 last remarks from Bodhi and Cal on, on free speech? Cal? I would say, um, I mean, there's free speech. Remember that uh, there's no free speech without property rights, uh, and that's the tenet of capitalism. And the tenet of capitalism is, uh, you know, with anarcho-capitalism, free market anarchism, be a good capitalist. You know, you want to help the poor, you can't help the poor if you're poor yourself. You know, that's the opposite of what anarchists are doing. Uh, you know, trying to make themselves look like they're the poor. You know, you want to alleviate their condition, bring them to where you are. Uh, so be a good capitalist. Uh, be marketable, have great skills and craftsmanship. Uh, do the opposite of what communists have been doing. Uh, and so with that, stay liberated. Bodhi? Um, I, ooh, this could be a whole other show, it but could I, be a whole other I, show. we have to have you on another time and talk about I know. property rights. Awesome. We're going to have to talk yes. about property rights. I don't yes, want to get too to much into that. it. That is, it's triggering me because I don't, <laughs> believe, I don't believe in rights. Okay. I don't believe there's a exists. conversation to have. But that's there a conversation. Next we'll time, have to have next time. Next, next time. time. Yes. yes. And, uh, uh, yeah, from me, from me, free speech is the fruit of a preference, which is that I would like to live in a world in which I have the, the greatest opportunity to uh, make decisions of my own free will and volition with as, as, uh, as least coercive action in response to what I'm doing, as, as, as least, or the minimal coercive action uh, response. And so that's why I, that's my justification for free speech, it's Paul's preference. And I think Paul's preference <laughs> is the, it, it, Paul's preference is good for humanity. <laughs> So there you go. So Cal, I want to thank you very much. It's been awesome having you on the show. We're definitely going to have to have you on again. Uh, please, on. please, thank you, thank you, Bodhi. Thank you, Paul. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. This is awesome. And uh, we'll we'll see you guys. Is TV is not a regularly scheduled show, so we'll see you when we see you. And be sure to check us out on our. Uh, actually, just go to right there. You see behind us. It says is TV dot me. <laughs> Right, right as, as no, no, you're not. <laughs> you're not. You're not. There you go. Yes, is <laughs> TV doc me. All of the stuff will be there when I post this on YouTube. It'll automatically show up on on that page as well. So everybody, uh, you know, be free and stuff. Be free. See you guys at the victory party. Yes. Oh yes. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah.